Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ray Smock, the interim director of the Robert C. Byrd Center for Congressional History and Education. And thank you all for joining us this evening uh, for what we know will be a very enjoyable book talk by, by my dear friend, Don Ritchie. Uh, I've known Don since we were graduate students together at the University of Maryland many years ago. And uh, Don also serves on the Bird Center's Board of Directors. And uh, this will be the last of our, our regular uh, series of programs uh, for the year. And uh, then we will come back with another exciting round of programs in the fall. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the Bird Center's activities during the summer, we turn our attention to our uh, teaching uh, institute for West Virginia teachers. So uh, we'll have a busy summer uh, doing uh, the, the wonderful teacher institute that uh, we in enjoy doing and that the teachers seem to like so much. Uh, and then again, we'll be back in the fall. Maybe, who knows, we'll be back with, with some, some live uh, programming that you can attend. Uh, we'll, we hope for that. Uh, but otherwise, we're ready to continue with the programs uh, on, on Zoom. Um, so um, the, uh, in the fall, of course, we will have the, the Tommy Moses Memorial Lecture on the Constitution in September. But right now, you're looking at the cover of Don Ritchie's uh, new book, which will come out on, uh, on June 1st. Uh, Don Ritchie is the historian emeritus of the United States Senate. And at the Senate, he conducted an oral history program and edited for publication the transcripts of the previously closed hearings of Senator Joseph McCarthy. That was a six volume study, fascinating stuff. A former president of the Oral History Association, he also served on the Council of the American Historical Association and as a delegate to the American Council of Learned Societies. His books include Press Gallery, Congress and the Washington Correspondence, Doing Oral History, Doing Oral History is the standard textbook for anyone doing oral history. Uh, and, all, and, and he also has done a book called uh, um, American Journalist, Getting the, uh, the Story, a Reporting from Washington, The History of the Washington Press Corps, Electing FDR, the, elect, uh, the New Deal election of 1932, and the United States Congress, a very short introduction. Uh, now, Drew Pearson is someone that every president from FDR to Richard Nixon called a liar. And uh, his, his column and his radio uh, broadcasts were essential for anybody in the, uh, for uh, 40 years in Washington society. So this new book that I mentioned here and you see here is, is uh, gonna be published uh, on June 1 by Oxford University Press. And I'll turn it over uh, to Don Ritchie. And as and uh, afterwards, uh, you, the chat will uh, you'll answer questions in in the chat. And uh, Jody Brummage will uh, narrate and moderate uh, the chat questions. So I hope you all enjoy the evening. Well, thank you, Ray. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, and there was a Florida congressman who once told the House of Representatives. I rose this morning and had my breakfast spoiled by Drew Pearson. Uh, now, some of you know and remember Drew Pearson, not the Dallas Cowboys wide receiver, uh, but the newspaper columnist that he was named for. Uh, the, the journalist Drew Pearson published a daily Washington merry go -round column that appeared in more than 600 newspapers in the United States and abroad between 1932 and his death in 1969. The merry-go-round could make or break a day for any member of Congress. Favorable mentions in the column boosted political careers and exposés undermined them. Drew Pearson believed that those who wrote the laws ought to abide by them. And he taunted legislators about their misdeeds, denounced lax ethics rules, exposed members who took kickbacks from their staff salaries and chided others for junketing on uh, taxpayer dollars. Pearson also took credit for the indictment, imprisonment, censure, and expulsion of a half a dozen members of Congress and the defeat of many more at the polls. It might not have mattered much to the members of Congress 
if the Mary Grant had appeared exclusively in the Washington Post. The trouble was its widespread circulation went to papers that, were, that their constituents were likely to be reading. Now, Drew Pearson is the subject of my new book, The Columnist. Although he died a half a century ago, his career provides insights into how the media shapes public opinion and political behavior. It also is related in a lot of ways to the charges of fake news that we hear, uh, since he was constantly being called a liar and sued for libel. Now, Pearson specialized in breaking secrets and revealing what happened behind closed doors in Washington. He published stories that the rest of the media either ignored or considered too hot to handle. Rather than write about pre uh, politicians' press releases, he published the story behind those releases, the motivations behind those releases. He published classified documents. He published bits of overheard conversation, whistleblowers' complaints. Now, the passage of time and the opening of papers and his diaries provide some clues as to who was actually leaking to him and how reliable those sources were. In addition, the opening of government records for after a half century uh, gives us some evidence to prove or disprove some of the allegations that he published in his daily column and that he broadcast on his weekly radio broadcast and later on his uh, brief television program. Much of the columnist deals with the presidents with whom Pearson covered, from Herbert Hoover to Richard Nixon. Herbert Hoover tried to fire, get him fired. FDR called him a chronic liar. Harry Truman ordered the FBI to investigate him. Dwight Eisenhower ostensibly ignored him, but then sent his press con his secretary out to trash him. Uh, JFK expressed frustration that all the powers of the presidency gave him no control over the columnist. LBJ co-opted him and uh, Richard Nixon put him at the very top of his enemies list. My book is replete with presidential stories, but since this talk is being sponsored by the Robert C. Byrd Center, I thought it'd be more appropriate today to focus attention on Pearson's reporting on Congress and the many breakfasts that he spoiled. It was my own connection as a Senate historian that uh, brought me to this topic uh, because um, when in the Senate, uh, when we were created in 1975, the Senate Historical Office, the Senate considered making the office a public information office. Then they thought twice about it and decided, no, every senator was his or her own public information office and we should stick to history. But you know, the Senate is a 200 year old institution and it works on precedent largely. So uh, historical questions came up all the time and eventually reporters began calling us to try to figure out uh, how to put current events into perspective of, of history. The media uh, eventually determined that we were a neutral fact-driven uh, operation. Uh, they labeled us straight shooters because we didn't take sides politically and they began calling us more frequently. The only year that I tried to keep track, I logged phone calls from 331 different reporters, columnists, broadcasters, and fact checkers. As I was being questioned by these reporters, I got interested in how reporters operated and also in the accuracy of their reports. After all, I figured I was an historian using newspaper articles as my sources. Did I know anything about the people who wrote those articles? And could I trust everything that they wrote? Uh, so those questions led me to uh, research on the 19th century Washington Press Corps, and that was my book, Press Gallery. And then on the 20th century, a book called Reporting from Washington. And being a link between the two eras, Drew Pearson actually appeared in both books. Then when I retired from the Senate, Pearson's stepson, Tyler Abel, approached me and urged me to write a book about the columnist because he felt his name had faded from public memory over time. He offered me complete access to Pearson's papers and his diaries, and he took me to the hayloft of his barn and pulled a tarpaulin off of a set of file cabinets and uh, offered me access to all the material inside that had never been made be uh, available until then. Uh, he basically gave me uh, a free range of all that material, including an oral history project that he had conducted with his family and staff. Uh, and uh, he pledged not to try to shape my interpretation. So it was an offer I couldn't refuse. The chief drawback to writing a book about Drew Pearson 
was that the bulk of his papers are housed at the LBJ Library in Austin, Texas. And despite having been there for half a century, they're not yet fully processed. I spent some time in Texas, but the saving grace came when Pearson's secretary showed up to do an oral history and brought with her two large archival boxes filled with papers. And these were the papers that Drew Pearson himself had culled from his massive manuscript collection that he felt best represented his experiences in his life. Uh, and he pulled them out so he could write his memoirs, books that he was never able to complete. Uh, the, that was just a, a godsend. And in fact, it be, served as a, as a roadmap for me uh, to go through the rest of this very extensive collection. And then there were all those columns that Pearson wrote. He wrote a column every single day of the year, and he did it for, from 1932 until 1969. There is that 50,000 pages worth of these columns, and they're completely online now at the American University's digital archives. Now, I started out, Ray Smock and I started out in graduate school back in the days when we had to thumb our way through brittle newsprint and crank microfilm uh, to try to find anything. So it was just astonishing to me that I could get access to every column that Pearson had ever written uh, by sitting at my home computer. As I read through this material, it became clear that for all his stature and prominence, Drew Pearson had made some powerful detractors. Presidents, prime ministers, senators, representatives, they all called him a liar and some of them sued him for libel. Tracking down those accusations, a pattern developed. Uh, Drew Pearson certainly made his share of mistakes, but they were usually because of haste or misunderstanding. And some of those people who leaked information to him uh, were less than honest about their intentions. But I never found an instance where Pearson knowingly lied. Uh, instead, it was the people who were making accusations against him who were mostly likely lying about this, the, the subject that they were uh, protesting. In, uh, Pearson was raised as a Quaker, uh, and he regarded truth as a moral objective and also as a self-defense mechanism. Because he was sued so often, 120 times, more than any other journalist, uh, he had to uh, argue these cases and defend himself by proving that the charges that he made were true. And in fact, he won all but one of his cases. In that one case, he wanted to appeal but his lawyers persuaded him that it would be a lot cheaper to settle out of court. One of the toughest lawsuits that he faced was by a congressman, a Democrat from Cleveland, Ohio, uh, by the name of Martin Sweeney. Uh, in 1938, the merry-go-round charged that Martin Sweeney had teamed up with the anti-Semitic radio broadcaster, Father Charles, Charles Kaplan, to block the appointment of a Jewish attorney to be a federal judge. Sweeney not only sued Pearson for libel, uh, but he initiated suits against 68 of the 325 newspapers that were at that time carrying the merry-go-round, and he threatened to sue in all of them. Now, the United States lacked a single libel law. In a sense, every state had its own libel law, and that meant that Pearson had to hire local attorneys. He had to study the local situation. Uh, he had to give depositions, and he had to travel, in some cases, to testify in these cases. Uh, so it was very expensive to be sued like this. And of course, he was afraid that his newspapers would also face uh, libel suits. Uh, and he wanted to uh, avoid that situation. So he was determined to fight them all. He did take each one of these to, to court. And in most cases, the courts sided with Pearson. A judge in Texas ruled that the ordinary reader of the Corpus Christi Caller Times probably never heard of uh, Congressman Sweeney before the publication. Uh, didn't remember his name five minutes after they read the column and didn't care one way or the other whether he opposed the appointment or on what grounds. Eventually, uh, Mr. Sweeney got tired and quit. Uh, so uh, the, that was a, an expensive lesson for, uh, for Drew Pearson. Uh, by the way, the Senate did confirm the Jewish attorney and the federal judge that, uh, uh, as a federal judge, and he spent the rest of his career on the court and Congressman Sweeney was very soon after defeated for re-election. Now, outraged targets of the column continued to file libel suits against Pearson, even though the courts consistently ruled in his favor. Eventually, the US Supreme Court in 1964, in the famous case of New York Times versus Sullivan, 
uh, severely limited the ability of public officials uh, to sue uh, someone for libel uh, because they had to prove actual malice. And in fact, they used uh, the Sweeney case as one of the precedents that they cited uh, in that, that uh, land breaking uh, um, Supreme Court decision. Now, most members of Congress didn't go to the trouble of suing Drew Pearson. Instead, they stood up in the House and the Senate to denounce him. And that because protected them as well because they could not be sued in, in return. Uh, members of Congress have immunity for anything that they say on the floor of the Senate. Probably the most memorable of all of these verbal outbursts uh, came about because of an incident that Pearson witnessed firsthand, but didn't report for another half a dozen years. He was in the Democratic cloakroom at the Senate one day when senators came rushing in to say that the very hot-headed senator from Tennessee, Kenneth McKellar, had pulled a knife on a senator from New York, Royal Copeland, and had to be restrained by other senators. Pearson took note of this. And six years later, he was writing a column about Congress, Senator uh, McKellar's tendency to put his own relatives on the, on the government payroll. And he mentioned, he said that uh, most of his colleagues remain in awe of McKellar's lashing tongue. Some even fear him. They remember the occasion when McKellar pulled a knife and charged a colleague on the Senate floor until he was disarmed. Now, Senator McKellar was famous for his sharp tongue. And he jumped up in the Senate the next day after that column appeared, denied ever pulling a knife on anybody, called it a willful, deliberate, malicious, dishonest, intensely cowardly, low, degrading, filthy lie out of whole cloth. I never pulled a life knife on any person in my life. So Pearson went back to the Senate, checked with the staff of the Senate press gallery. They all remembered the incident. And he found some other senators who were willing to testify that uh, that's exactly what had happened. And then for good measure, Pearson published that the long denunciation that, that uh, McKella had made of him in the Washington Merry Grant. In fact, uh, uh, it amused uh, Pearson when he got attacked like that and he felt that it just drew more public attention to the column. Now, Senator McKella was not alone. Uh, there were, he had plenty of company. The congressional record is just full of denunciations of Drew Pearson. And he said, considering all I have written about members of Congress, you can't really blame them for making, up, uh, making speeches against me. He realized uh, and he reasoned that the, the facts you know, that he had would usually prove him correct, no matter how fiercely and profanely his targets howled. To remind me, re, me readers of these, uh, this situation, in 1954, the Washington Mary Grant published what uh, Pearson called a liar's scoreboard. And he listed five members of Congress who had accused him of lying. Each one of them had eventually been convicted of the charges that he had brought up against them. Several of them went to jail, all of them lost their seats. Probably the, the best case of this is that, that of a uh, New Jersey Congressman J. Parnell Thomas, who was the chairman of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Thomas had wielded power that could ruin people's lives. And he most notably took on the Hollywood 10 uh, in 1947. These were screenwriters and actors uh, and uh, directors who were being accused of being communists. Uh, Congressman Thomas uh, po po came out across as a, as a uh, paragon of virtue, but the, uh, the column noticed that he had been uh, padding his office payroll and taking pick kickbacks from his secretarial staff, which he failed to declare in his income taxes. Now, how did Drew Pearson discover that Congressman uh, Thomas was taking kickbacks? Well, uh, Thomas had a secretary, Helen Campbell, who was quite jealous of his attentions to other women in the office. And when, they, when Thomas hired a new clerk secretary, he drove her home one day and Helen, um, Helen uh, Campbell followed him. Uh, then the next morning, she drove back to the clerk typist department, found the congressman's car still parked out in front, and the hood was cold. Uh, so she turned over what she knew to Drew Pearson, who promptly uh, published it. Congressman Thomas, of course, called Pearson a liar. But the FBI investigated and found there was merit in the columnist's accusations. The indignant congressman responded by charging the Justice Department with 
coddling communist traitors and subjecting him to a vicious smear campaign. When Thomas, however, went before a grand jury, he took the Fifth Amendment, which is what many of the witnesses before HUAC did as well. And the trial ended abruptly when Thomas withdrew his not guilty plea. Uh, he was convicted, he was fined and sentenced to six to 18 months in prison. And in some measure of poetic justice, he wound up at the Danbury prison where some of the members of the Hollywood 10 were also imprisoned. Helen Campbell lost her job, of course, by turning in her employer uh, and uh, uh, exposing his misdeeds. Uh, Drew Pearson hired her as his own secretary. She worked for him for 15 years until she retired. Now, Pearson said that he'd hate to be remembered only as a jailer of congressmen. He felt the hardest job of a journalist was to decide whether a public official was telling the truth. He reasoned that diplomats lied as part of their profession and that some politicians lied just naturally. Uh, he, every uh, Senator representative that he charged with corruption lied about the facts, he said, but the truth convicted them. Exposing members of Congress posed some risks, however. They could subpoena him to testify. And if he refused to answer questions about his sources, they could jail him for contempt. They could also embarrass him as one of them did. That was a crusty, cantankerous Michigan congressman named Claire Huffman. In 1953, the merry-go-round accused Huffman of pressuring the Air Force to award a contract to two of his constituents, even though their company was too small to handle the job. But Pearson had misread the boundary lines of the congressional districts. And in fact, the company lay just outside of Huffman's district. Uh, in high indignation, Congressman uh, Hoffman subpoenaed uh, Pearson to testify, made him squirm in front of the photographers while he went over the geography of Michigan district by district. And the columnist apologized for mistakenly identified the, the contractors as his constituents, but he refused to retract the inference that uh, the congressman had improperly used his uh, influence uh, to get the contract for them. At another congressional hearing, a senator asked Pearson how he got his information. I have a file on practically every member of Congress, including yourself, he replied mischievously. I tried to watch all of your records. He described himself as a one man FBI, but like the Bureau, he couldn't trust every piece of information that he got. And uh, he had to, to sort through it and sort of sniff out what was the truth. His chief assistant, Jack Anderson, credited his boss with being able to detect something wrong even before the facts were in. He would sniff the air delicately and he would know that there was a crime involved. He would, with a few whiffs, determine that a public official was bad and that a public, and a public official was corrupt. Most famously, Drew Pearson conducted a four-year campaign against Senator Joseph McCarthy uh, for his reckless anti-communist crusade. Pearson's assistant, Jack Anderson, complained to him that Senator McCarthy was actually one of their best sources on Capitol Hill. He was always leaking to the, to the column. Uh, but Pearson responded, he may be a good man, Jack. Uh, he may be a good source, Jack, but he's a bad man. The, uh, the column's persistent criticism of McCarthy criticized the Senate, uh, really outraged the Senate. Uh, and one night, McCarthy physically assaulted Drew Pearson uh, in, in the Washington's uh, very swank Soulgrave Club, kicking and slapping him in the cloakroom of the club. Who should break up that fight but California Senator Richard Nixon? And Nixon always liked to tell that story years later, saying that he had saved Pearson's life. And do you think it ever did me any good with that bastard Pearson? He said, never. A few days later, by the way, Joe McCarthy rose in the Senate and accused Drew Pearson of being a communist puppet. The senator had called, uh, uh, the senator then called on Americans to boycott Pearson's radio sponsor, Adam Hatz, and the radio sponsor caved, dropped the program and cost Pearson half of his income. But it was the Washington merry go -round that revealed that one of uh, Senator McCarthy's chief staffers, G. David Shine, had dodged the draft which prompted army uh, doctors to reclassify him. Next, the column revealed that uh, McCarthy's uh, chief counsel, Roy Cohen, was demanding weekend passes for and other favors and special privileges for Shine. 
McCarthy was then investigating the Army Signal Corps. And the Army claimed that he was prolonging that investigation to blackmail it into giving special favors to Shine. McCarthy said, no, no, the army is, is, uh, is trying to uh, uh, hold Shine as a hostage to get my investigation to stop. That forced the US Senate to hold the famous Army McCarthy hearings. And Senator McCarthy's behavior at those hearings really demonstrated to the public exactly what Drew Pearson had been writing about in his column for years. Pearson uh, did more in many ways to undermine Joe McCarthy than any other jur journalist, even uh, Edward R. Murrow, who usually gets the credit. Now, conservatives complained that uh, Pearson was usually attacking them. Uh, he was a liberal in his own politics, uh, but you know, he basically went after anyone that he considered to be uh, abusing their power of office. Notably, the Washington Mary Grand conducted a sustained attack on a liberal Democrat from New York, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. for his flagrant abuses of power. Actually, initially, uh, Pearson wrote very favorably about Powell. He called him a brainy Negro congressman who stood like a David against the Goliath of Southern segregationalists. Uh, but the column of them blasted uh, uh, Powell for his absenteeism and his, for his expensive government paid trips to Europe and the Bahamas, and eventually began calling him the Harlem Globetrotter. Uh, pa Pearson complained about that, Pierce, that to Powell's long absences were hurting anti-poverty legislation. Uh, and eventually, the, because of the uh, publicity in the column, the House Democrats stripped Powell of his committee chairmanship and the full House uh, voted not to seat him. So Drew Pearson basically was prodding Congress to, to police themselves, not to rely on him to do it. Uh, he thought they needed to establish a code of ethics uh, to accept the same conflict of interest rules that applied to the rest of the government uh, and uh, to set up uh, internal review and punishment systems, uh, some kind, something more than just the machinery of cloture. And eventually both the House and Senate did create ethics committees. And to look into the, exactly the kinds of allegations that the uh, Mary Graham was reporting. He said, this column has been writing about Congress Congress misbehavior for about 20 years, he said. This, he wrote this in 1963, and his name, names, and printed facts. But the column had also paid tribute to productive members who made democracy work. It's not fair to them, and I believe they are in the great majority, to have their reputations spoiled by congressmen who do cheat. Now, just switching at this stage uh, for the, the stories that he was writing about Congress, uh, one of his best sources of information about Congress and about everything else was the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And in fact, there are a thousand pages of documents at the National Archives about Drew Pearson that are now open for research. And they show that uh, initially the column was very favorable to J. Edgar Hoover, called him a super G-man. And Hoover returned the favor by often reviewing the column in advance uh, to make sure that the facts were accurate and afterwards, after accusations had been made, the FBI would then pursue investigations of some of the people that Pearson was targeting. Uh, even when, when President Truman uh, ordered the FBI to a uh, wiretap Drew Pearson to find out who was leaking to him, uh, Hoover tipped off Pearson in advance and said, well, you know how, how, how Harry is. Uh, they had to go ahead and do it. And Pearson used to joke that uh, he had so many listeners on his telephone calls that he could sell commercials. Uh, when the basically government agencies were always asking the FBI to track down who was leaking documents, Hoover would respond that it was just about impossible to find that out and that they ought to do a better job of keeping their own records to be secret. And eventually, uh, because of the Red Scare, Hoover and Pearson fell out. They came out on opposite sides of that, that great debate. Uh, and, uh, and Pearson was very critical of, uh, of J. Edgar Hoover. In fact, a correspondent for the Soviet newspaper Pravda once told uh, Pearson that the Soviet embassy staff in Washington wanted to know how he would dare write those things about J. Edgar Hoover and stay in business. And Pearson said, well, he, he conceded that if he was a Russian, he would never be able to stand up against the secret police in, uh, in Moscow the way he could uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, 
uh, and, but he, he called it as he saw it and he became critical of, uh, of Hoover and Hoover of course was outraged. There are many memos in the files at the, of the FBI in which Hoover has written really ugly little things across the top and the, in the margins about, uh, about uh, distrusting anything that, uh, that Drew Pearson was publishing. So in sum, Drew Pearson's career demonstrated the power of political journalism. His reporting influenced public opinion, influenced the voters, influenced public officials, and influenced public policy. The rest of the Washington Press Corps often resented Pearson for elbowing his way to the front of so many stories, and they claimed sometimes that his column was factually shaky. But a group of them were having lunch at the National Press Club one day and going over all their gripes against Pearson. And one of them finally said, let's face it, not one of us here would have the nerve to write what Pearson does or hope to get it printed. And the others agreed that they always read the column because they never knew when it was going to produce the best story of the day coming out of Washington. At times, his exposés met with indifference but he could often repeat the story day after day. He liked to hammer home a story at times until eventually the rest of the press corps began to pay attention, began to do their own researching and encourage the pack to get involved in the pursuit of, uh, of the real story that was involved. The editors at the Washington Post described Pearson's technique as scattershot, sometimes right on target, other times missing altogether. It seemed almost as if that was a conscious strategy. His re readiness to risk being wrong every once in a while uh, was the necessary price for more often getting it right. And in fact, my research has shown over and over that Pearson was generally right in his accusations and that he performed a valuable public service and he was the national watchdog. In fact, we need a lot more like him. And I wanna thank you for listening to me today and also thank the Bird Center for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about the columnist. I hope you'll have a chance to enjoy the book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Um, everyone that's in the audience, I encourage you to enter questions um, for Don in the chat box. Um, I have a list of some that have already come in and I'm going to start um, sharing those with our speaker, but I encourage you to please enter questions um, into the chat box. Uh, so Don, I think an appropriate question to start with that, that I'm interested in is, how did Drew Pearson get started in, in his journalism career and how did he rise to the, to the level of prominence that he, he did? Right, uh, Pearson actually as aspired to be a diplomat, but as a young man, he, he realized that uh, diplomats needed to be independently wealthy because the State Department didn't pay them very much uh, to entertain around the world. And he decided that maybe he could work his way into diplomacy through journalism. He said at the time, he didn't realize how little journalists were paid as well. Uh, and he became a diplomatic correspondent. He went around the world doing, uh, as a very young man, uh, writing stories and came back and was a diplomatic correspondent for the uh, Baltimore Sun. And he and another reporter named uh, Bob Allen, Robert Allen, uh, got together and published a book in 1931 called The Washington Merry-Go-Round. They published it anonymously, didn't put their names on the book, uh, but it was an expose of Herbert Hoover's Washington. And it was very droll and it, was, it sold very well. It was a big bestseller in 1931. The President Hoover was so outraged that he got the Bureau of Investigation to find out who the anonymous authors were and he tried to get them fired. The Christian Science Monitor fired Bob Allen. The Baltimore Sun didn't fire uh, Drew Pearson because you know, they were in Baltimore and they didn't think skewering people in Washington was really all that bad. Uh, but uh, uh, two years later, uh, Pearson wrote another book uh, uh, with Allen called More Washington Mary Garam. And at this point, the, the Baltimore said, you know, we're not a keyhole paper and they fired him as well. So Allen and Pearson then decided to start a column and they started it in December of 1932. Now, before that, Washington DC was not the big story. I mean, in the 1920s, people wanted to read about Babe Ruth or Al Capone or Charles Lindbergh, not about Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, people just didn't think a Washington column was going to attract that many uh, interested readers. But they started just as Franklin Roosevelt was elected and just as the New Deal was coming. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to know what was going on in Washington. And Pearson's column became a good source of inside information in the New Deal because he had a lot of friends in the New Deal, including members of the cabinet, including President Roosevelt, who leaked to him from time to time when, uh, when he wanted to. Roosevelt was always offended when somebody else leaked something about him, but he didn't mind uh, doing the leaks himself. And so that's what got uh, Pearson into the business. And that's how he became a, a successful person right from the very beginning uh, and through his entire career. Interesting. Um, so you mentioned that um, you know he, he tended to go after members of either side of the aisle with, with fair, fair equality. But I'm curious, did, was there a particular um, subject or theme or, or perceived wrong that the subjects of his investigations and writing were doing? Did he tend to go after one specific thing or did he target any and all wrongs that were being perpetrated on Capitol Hill? Well, some of these were criminal offenses, like uh, getting kickbacks uh, from your staff, for instance. Uh, others were more political offenses. He thought he was very much against the seniority system. He thought that uh, representatives from safe districts and senators from one party states uh, accrued so much seniority that they, they took hold of the power, uh, the power of the committees and that innovative younger members of Congress couldn't get into those leadership positions. And so he campaigned vigorously against the seniority system and he lambasted uh, older members who he was always after them to get to them to retire from Congress at a certain period when he thought they were no longer uh, functioning properly. Uh, so he had a lot of different uh, arguments. He would get behind legislation. He would come and, and uh, testify. He would write speeches for the members of Congress to give. Uh, Ralph Nader said that uh, once Drew Pearson got behind an idea, he gave a sense of inevitability to it because he gave it so much publicity. And that's the, the interesting thing was that, you know, a, a senator can stand up and speak for hours in the U.S. Senate and get a paragraph in the newspaper the next day. Pearson had a column every day in the newspaper. Uh, now, he could pursue this in a lot of ways and get much more attention than the average member of Congress could. So members of Congress, of course, wanted to get their ideas into the column. Uh, and so they were often dropping hints to him about what was going on, giving him stories. And they were also uh, whispering to him about what their colleagues were doing. So a lot of his sources were sources on Capitol Hill. And, and anyone who's ever worked at the Capitol building can tell you that you can't walk from one side of the Capitol to the other without picking up a couple of stories. People are always whispering about what's going on. And there's always a lot of give and take as to what's happening. And, and for every person in the Capitol who has a good reason to keep something secret, there's at least one other person who has a good reason to get it open. And so it's very hard for members to do things completely in secrecy. Uh, so uh, Pearson had uh, terrific sources and, uh, and he made the best of it. He was, a, uh, he was a very effective person. I don't wanna suggest that all he did was criminal investigations, but he certainly uh, by getting members of Congress convicted and censured and impeached and uh, all the rest that, that showed the power of his column. Very interesting. So I think there's kind of two kind of technical questions that I'm gonna to ask together. One is uh, what is a keyhole newspaper? You, I think you used that term in the <laughs> his case with the Baltimore Sun. Yes, well, I actually, at one point, uh, the, one of the, the titles that was bantied about about the, the book was the keyhole columnist, because he used to call himself the keyhole peeper. Uh, you know, the old uh, idea of the person who sort of peeked into keyholes, especially in hotels, to find out what kind of things were happening behind closed doors. Well, he was always looking for what was happening behind closed doors on Capitol Hill. These days we have sunshine regulations. Congress mandates that most committee meetings be held in public. Most business has to be held in public. That wasn't true in Pearson's day. A huge part of the really nitty gritty work of Congress was done in closed sessions. Uh, I edited uh, 160 of Joe McCarthy's closed hearings, for instance, that were essentially trial runs for some of his later public hearings. 
But a lot of legislation was written in, uh, in closed hearings. A lot of appropriations were decided on in closed hearings. And Pearson was peeking through the keyhole to find out what was going on and telling the public what their elected officials were doing. Uh, he felt that the public who were gonna cast votes needed to know what was actually happening. And the other uh, technical question is, um, at, at sort of his height, how, how, how far was the distribution of his column? I mean, was it syndicated nationwide or? It was nationwide and then went into a number of newspapers in Latin America and also in Europe as well. Um, it had uh, at its height about 660 newspapers. Uh, towards the end, a lot of them were weekly papers. Uh, so they, they had a deal where the larger your, your uh, circulation was, the more you would pay him. The less your circulation was, the less you would have to pay him. So small weekly papers could afford to do that. And of course, if there were a lot of them producing it, then they would produce a, a good revenue. But that meant that in addition to writing seven columns a week, he also wrote an additional column that was a synopsis of all the others that went to the weekly papers. Uh, and this is, is quite amazing. You should go to the American University Digital Archives and look at the original columns. Uh, they're, they're quite detailed and fascinating reading. Many newspapers didn't publish the whole column. They thought sometimes he was a little too critical, especially of people that they liked. And so they just would clip out that paragraph or they were afraid maybe there might be a, a libel suit. And they'd clip out that paragraph because he usually had multiple stories within one column. And then on some days, they just wouldn't publish it at all. Uh, the Washington Post, for instance, became his principal paper in 1941 and until 1969. And I could look up those columns on ProQuest, but they didn't publish all the columns. Well, sometimes he was writing critically about a candidate that they had endorsed for office. And so the Post just didn't really want to bring it up. Uh, sometimes they just didn't believe what he'd written and they didn't put it in there. And it took them a little while to realize that he was onto a, a story. And of course, it would irritate him enormously if the, uh, if the Post didn't publish it. And the Post got so nervous about that column. Uh, very early on, they, they were excited to get it, but the, the, he put them into hot water on a number of occasions. And they got a lot of negative letters in from readers. And so they kept moving the column further and further back into the paper until it wound up on the comic strip pages. When I came to Washington, I was, uh, Drew Pearson was still publishing and that if you read the comics, you saw the Washington Mary Graham. Pearson said that didn't bother him because a lot more people read the comics than read the editorials. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of our uh, audience members asked the question about uh, Drew Pearson's uh, portrayal in the film, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Uh, and specifically was wondering about how, how active was he in radio uh, broadcasting? Yes, well, in The Day the Earth Stood Still, it was a 1951 movie. Pearson appears on screen as a radio and television uh, announcer announcing the landing of a spaceship on the mall. And that may seem like fake news, but it was just the, his showmanship idea. He liked to, to uh, act and he, he, as a young man, he had organized parades for Chautauqua meetings, uh, and he always had a bit of showmanship to what he was doing. Uh, so he was quite happy. Hollywood put him in, I think, three different movies over time. He was primarily a radio person, the, other than the column. He did a weekly 15-minute radio broadcast every Sunday night. Uh, he and Walter Winchell were both on about the same time, on the, uh, one after the other, on, uh, uh, on one of the networks. And uh, they were very popular programs. It was a national program. He had over 200 uh, stations that were uh, signed up for it. He tried to make the transition to, uh, to television. And uh, on the radio, he has a staccato voice. Uh, he just barks it out. And that was sort of the hot medium and people liked that sort of thing. That's the way Walter Winchell delivered his news as well. Then he went to television. He tried to do the same thing. And the television producer said, no, no, don't bark, you're not really that kind of a personality. You have to tone it down, yet this is a cooler medium. And in fact, he did present himself in a more subdued manner on television, but he was an older man at the time. He just didn't adjust to the new technology. Uh, and he wasn't, he admitted constantly that he was not as successful 
on television as he had been on the radio. And that was true of his whole generation. The, the most famous radio announcers for the most part didn't make it into what they called this new form of radio, which is television. They didn't, they couldn't deal with the makeup and the cameras and the heat and all the rest of it. Uh, they much preferred sitting in the studio with a microphone. Edward R. Murrow is one of the very few who makes the transition very successfully. And a whole new generation of uh, reporters become the, uh, the, the television correspondents. Another audience member asked um, whether Drew Pearson was an active uh, Quaker and whether his Quaker background uh, influenced his, his work. Yes, his father taught at Swarthmore. And when the family moved there in 1904, when Pearson was just a little boy, uh, the, the, father, the whole family joined the Friends Society and they adopted the, the Quaker voice, the, thou, thine. And when they talked to, and they wrote letters to each other, uh, they, they spoke as the and thy. Uh, and he, when he had meals uh, uh, at home, he would have a, a silent prayer in the, in the Quaker style. He didn't, for the most part, go to meetings in Washington. But whenever he went home to see his family at Swarthmore, he would go to the meeting house there. But I think the values of growing up as a Quaker, this idea of human equality uh, and uh, sort of justice, and uh, uh, that, that prompted him uh, on a lot of the issues that he was involved in. Uh, he very early on, he, he was slow to come to it in the 1930s and early 1940s, but he early on became uh, sympathetic with the civil rights movement, uh, especially if he became very opposed to the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and, uh, and he consistently carried that through. And I think that was an example of his Quaker morality uh, coming through. And uh, Arthur Schlesinger, the historian said that it was probably because of his Quaker morality that he was so genuinely shocked whenever he uncovered some kind of wrongdoing in Washington, DC. He never got to be cynical in that sense. He expected people to live up to their public images. Uh, and, uh, and he felt it was his duty to expose them when they didn't. Interesting. So another question that came in was, um, you know, you focused a lot on, on, his, con on his interaction and coverage of Congress. Uh, tonight, but was there one particular president that he seemed to spar with more than others, or was he equal opportunity there as well? <laughs> he gave a lot of trouble to every president along the way. Uh, LBJ hated him when he was in Congress and the Senate because he blasted him a lot as a Senate leader. But Johnson was determined to make sure that the, the Mary Grant was on his side, and he went out of his way to uh, bring Pearson in to confide in him to uh, to get a good press, and so he LBJ is the only president really who gets a fairly consistently good press from uh, the column. And poor Pearson took a lot of lumps for that as the Vietnam War began heating up. A lot of people uh, really began to expect that he should have taken a stronger uh, side against it. He was not in favor of the war, but he never really attacked uh, Johnson on it. As far as the presidents he disliked. He's starting with Herbert Hoover, uh, who was a Quaker. Interestingly, the two Quaker presidents, Hoover and Richard Nixon, probably got the most grief from the Quaker columnists, maybe because he held them to higher standards. Uh, and Nixon, certainly from the moment he got into Congress, uh, disliked uh, Pearson and, and the feeling was mutual. Uh, uh, six months after he'd been elected to the House, Richard Nixon was sending letters of congratulation to congressmen who were getting attacked in the, in the uh, Washington Mary Graham, saying there was a badge of honor to be attacked by, uh, by Drew Pearson. Uh, you would think that because Pearson was a liberal and voted with the Democrat, well, he could vote, he couldn't vote until 1960s when Washington DC got the vote uh, in presidential elections, but he supported liberal Democrats and liberal democratic programs. But uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, was just furious at him and he called him a chronic liar at one point because he, he, Roosevelt didn't like to play his cards close to his vest and he didn't want people tipping things off. And it was Pearson who uh, first published news about things like the destroyers for bases deal coming up in uh, World War II. Uh, it was accurate, the White House denied it, but three weeks later they had to admit uh, that it was true. So uh, Franklin Roosevelt was always annoyed. Harry Truman uh, 
uh, really disliked the fact that the column sometimes uh, uh, criticized his wife and daughter. And Truman said, in, back in Missouri, we put our women up on a pedestal, I'm gonna keep them there. And he just despised Drew Pearson. Uh, he got the FBI to, to wiretap his phones. Uh, he did everything. And of course, Pearson was uh, exposing the fact that some of Truman's aides were, had accepted favors like uh, deep freezes and mink coats uh, from lobbying organizations. And that created the image of the mess in Washington that uh, was used against uh, Harry Truman. Although after Truman left office, uh, he began to look a lot better to Pearson in retrospect. And uh, Pearson began to write nice things about him. And the first television appearance that uh, Truman made after he was president was on Pearson's program. Pearson went out to visit the Truman Library and Harry Truman actually wrote a letter that Pearson could use whenever anybody uh, cited Harry Truman calling him a liar, which uh, actually Truman called him even worse things than that. Uh, but uh, basically saying that uh, even though I disagreed with him, I thought he was performing a public service and he was an honorable man. So, so they, they patched it up. Uh, the, the, the president who was hardest for, uh, uh, for Pearson was Eisenhower, because Eisenhower kept his distance, you know, with the hidden hand presidency. He didn't want to go out and get into a public fight with a columnist. And so uh, it, it was very hard as a target to attack somebody who wasn't attacking you in return. But Eisenhower's press secretary, Jim Haggerty, just went after uh, uh, poor Pearson you know, savagely. And I'll give you one story, which was in 1956, when, when uh, Eisenhower was running for reelection, uh, the Washington Mary Grant said he collapsed on the campaign trail and had to be uh, sequestered in his hotel room for 24 hours to recoup, recover. Uh, Haggerty called a press conference and took the column and went down the line and said, there are, there's, a, there's a, a lie in every single sentence. And he counted 11 lies in, the, in that one section. There. It was all untrue. And uh, basically, uh, Pearson couldn't really verify the story because he'd gotten it from a reliable source, but he had no evidence. And so his, even his own staff said it was a boo-boo uh, and they sort of wrote it off. Well, you can go to the Eisenhower Library today and read Eisenhower's doctor's notes. And sure enough, Eisenhower collapsed on the campaign trail, had to be sequestered in his hotel room until his blood pressure came down uh, and, and spent that day with, only with his family. Uh, and even though his press secretary said he carried on business as usual, in fact, Pearson's column was correct. Interesting. So we had a question come in um, and you mentioned that at, at the beginning of his, his career and his, his professional life, he had his own political aspirations. Um, as he grew in stature, as he became more of a prominent, prominent figure in a lot of these um, uh, corruption <laughs> cases and things like that, did, did he um, step outside of the journal of, of journalism specifically to speak or to be an activist on behalf of certain causes, or did he sort of stay in the lane of, of journalist? He certainly supported causes. He supported legislation. He, he banged the drum loudly for legislation that he supported. Uh, he obviously supported various candidates, although he didn't publicly endorse candidates, but the column would be very favorable to certain co uh, candidates. Uh, he, um, he actually uh, considered, he, you know, he want, started out wanting to be a diplomat. And one of the ways that LBJ helped to co-opt him uh, in that period of the 60s was by suggesting to him that there was a possibility he might appoint him Secretary of State. And that was uh, Pearson's real aspiration. He would love to have been Secretary of State. His secretary in her oral history said the two things that he wanted that he didn't get, once was, one was a Pulitzer Prize and one was to become Secretary of State. And pretty much no one thought that he had a chance of becoming Secretary of State, but you have LBJ you know, who could coax anybody along on, on any particular issue and, and flatter them greatly. And uh, Jack Anderson said that really uh, LBJ was the only politician who successfully flattered uh, Pearson into thinking something like that. Uh, but he, he didn't run for office, uh, but he, he certainly supported candidates. He had, in 1968, he held a fundraiser at his home for Hubert Humphrey, who was running for president against Richard Nixon. Uh, he was much more effective as 
a columnist, however. And you know, there's an interesting thing in politics. A lot of very famous journalists, people like Joseph Pulitzer, William Randolph Hearst, Horace Greeley, they all ran for Congress at some time and they all served in Congress. And they all discovered that as a freshman member of Congress, they had far less power than they did as publishers of their newspapers. And so they all sort of retreated from the political arena and went back to their newspapers where they really could influence public opinion uh, and wield great power. But you, you miss, I suppose, the, the trappings of the office. <laughs> So I think I have uh, two last questions here that um, maybe pull the lens out a little bit wider. Um, and I mean, Don, you've made so many, so much extensive contribution to the scholarship on the press um, and even donated a valuable collection of works on the history of the press to our reference library here at the Bird Center. Um, and I'm curious in, in researching Drew Pearson, did you find in him uh, was was the amount of information available? His own personal papers was that uh, is is that something that you find in common among journalists, or is his is the amount of documentation for his career and his impact sort of an anomaly? The amount of documentation for Drew Pearson is definitely different than almost anything else. He saved everything. He also had an elaborate card system, an index to his. Uh, his massive uh, collection of, of uh, columns because he had to find out what he'd written about people in some cases 10 years earlier uh, to uh, when he was, when something new had uh, come along. Uh, so uh, Pearson's unusual in that respect. When I was working on newspaper columnists, uh, newspaper reporters, especially in the 19th century, they rarely ever left papers behind because they were being sent out uh, here and there. They were on the go constantly and you couldn't take large file cabinets along with you when you're on the train going from one place to the next. What I discovered was, while the reporters didn't save much, their editors and their publishers saved the letters that the reporters wrote to them. So I went to the editor's papers and found great amounts of material that way. Uh, in the 20th century, again, reporters don't start to save too much until they get, move up the, the chain. Uh, and uh, also they begin, the, the, the daily story is over, they throw away all their notes, they move on to the next thing. Once you're an editor, once you're a publisher, then you're more thinking of the long term of the business and your, and your own reputation. But uh, Jody, I'm very glad you mentioned the, the, the collection of books uh, that the uh, Robert Byrd Center has. And that is when I finished working on my book, Reporting from Washington, I had collected a large number of memoirs and biographies and all sorts of other books about journalists, American journalists. They were too much for me to house here. And I was finished with that. I didn't think I'd be writing another book about journalists. And so I gave them to the Robert C. Bird Center. And I'm so glad you have them because when I started Drew Pearson, one of the things I did was to drive up to Shepherdstown and use that collection because those memoirs had wonderful anecdotes about uh, Drew Pearson by many of his colleagues at the time. Uh, one other thing about uh, Pearson historically is that at the, at the turn of the 20th century, the, the people who were really the, uh, doing the work that he was doing were known as the muckrakers. They were the magazine writers who were writing the things that the daily newspaper reporters were either afraid to write or couldn't get their editors to put in the paper. And the muckraking magazines were exposing what was going on. Pearson modeled himself after the muckrakers. They were pretty much all gone by the end of the progressive era, uh, but he uh, uh, admired them and he carried on the tradition. And just after he died, uh, the Watergate scandal broke and that revived investigative reporting that Jack Anderson was able to win a Pulitzer Prize. A lot of honors went to investigative reporters. So Pearson is the link between the old muckraking era and the, the Watergate investigative reporting era. Uh, he sort of kept the tradition going in those uh, long, dry years in between. So I did have one more question come into the chat that I want to pass on to you before I give you my final question. And that is, uh, in reading his columns, was there one that stuck out in your mind as being of greater importance or significance than any other, or just a favorite one that you came across? There are... Um, there are a number of columns that are just astonishing to read now, but probably the most memorable was one that he wrote after United States Senator Lester Hunt committed suicide in 1954. And Pearson exposed the fact that Hunt was being blackmailed uh, 
by two other United States senators who are trying to get him to resign from the Senate. So they get somebody in their party to be appointed to his seat. The Senate was 50-50 tied at the time. Uh, Hunt's son had been arrested on a morals charge and had uh, basically been let out without, uh, without being uh, convicted. Uh, and uh, Joe McCarthy's aides and, and supporters in, uh, in the Senate found out about this and threatened to expose the story. Uh, Senator Hunt was devastated by it and he committed suicide. He shot himself in his office in the Senate uh, office building in 1954. Very few papers published that story. It, it was just too, too shocking. First off, homosexuality was a shocking story in 1954. A suicide was a shocking story and blackmail by famous politicians was a shocking story. So most newspapers just wouldn't touch it. But uh, the story has persisted in, in various forms because Alan Drury, the, uh, the journalist at the time was writing a novel called Advise and Consent. And he was in the midst of writing the story when this shocking suicide took place. And so he made that suicide the center of his story out of Senator who was being blackmailed. The book became a phenomenal bestseller. It was 102 weeks on the bestseller list, became a stage play in New York, it became a movie. Uh, it won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, it, it was just astonishing. And in recent years, there have been uh, books written about uh, Lester Hunt. There's been a play written about uh, Lester Hunt's family and about the instance of what, what, ha what happened at that stage. And all of those sources were drawing on the only journalist who was willing to tackle the story, and that was Drew Pearson. So it's one of those stories that really stands out among all the other columns. Very interesting. Well, the last question that I want to ask is, I mean, your work on Drew Pearson clearly demonstrates the impact that investigative journalism and that the press can have on our government and keeping politicians in check. And given the, the events of recent months and over the past year, um, does the press still occupy such a vital place in our representative democracy? And is there a journalist today who has the stature, the, the potent effect of Pearson? Um, or does the state of today's journalism, multimedia journalism, 24-hour news cycle, make it difficult for individual journalists to reach that level of impact? There isn't one columnist who has risen to the level of a Drew Pearson. There are certainly a lot of prominent columnists. I read many of them myself all the time, but no one of them uh, has, has uh, it's, it's sort of been diluted to some degree because there are so many columnists and op-ed pieces that are available at this stage. Also, the media has become so much more complex. In Drew Pearson's day, there were a handful of uh, networks, three major networks and some, some independent ones. Uh, people listen to the same programs. They watch the same news programs. Uh, so uh, someone like Pearson, when he got a, a radio program, got a huge audience and a great impact. Today, everything's been sort of divided up. You can watch news that fits your politics uh, and, and, and fits your views. Um, you don't have to listen to the other side. Uh, then we also have the social media in which non-journalists are involved. And the question often then is, well, what do I believe if there are people who are putting out information uh, that I can't rely on? One of the big differences in Pearson's day and today is that Supreme Court ruling, which basically made it hard for politicians to sue for libel. So that uh, today, a lot of uh, journalists uh, can get away with making really outrageous accusations that they can't substanti substantiate uh, and they've not called to account. It, but there are libel suits. And just recently, the libel suits that have come up over the, uh, uh, the, the last election, and especially with the voting the machines, the company that makes the voting machines has sued several major news uh, organizations and threatened very large libel suits, uh, defamation suits, and those uh, networks have begun issuing apologies. So uh, maybe there is some counterforce to try to get people uh, to uh, be a bit more uh, honest about it. Pearson had to be honest. I mean, he was in a vulnerable position. He had to be able to prove what he was saying. Uh, and uh, sometimes he couldn't, and sometimes he had to make it a retraction because some people told him things in private, but they wouldn't come forward in public to support that. But most of the time he felt when he went, in, the column went out, 
that he could back up what he had to say. And quite frankly, most people weren't willing to, uh, to, to carry the story on any longer by suing him or making too much of a fuss about it. So a lot of people swallowed the criticism rather quietly. Very interesting. Well, Don, thank you so much for taking this time tonight to share your research and your upcoming book on Drew Pearson. As many of us, I think in the last year have considered more deeply than perhaps in a, in a long time or ever, the role that the press plays in our representative democracy. And your work on Drew Pearson, as well as your um, extensive scholarship on the press in the United States is so crit critical and important. Um, and we appreciate all your work and your time to give this program for us tonight at the Bird Center. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Absolutely. And thank you to our audience for joining us tonight. Programs like this are made possible by the Friends of the Bird Center, a growing community of dedicated supporters and donors who are our essential partners in the work of, rep of advancing representative democracy. Later this summer, the Friends of the Bird Center is going to be holding a special fundraiser to support these types of programs, as well as our other civics education initiatives, and I'll invite you to keep an eye and an ear out for news of that event as it becomes available. In little less than a month, uh, the Bird Center will be embarking on our sixth annual Teacher Institute, uh, demonstrating innovative lesson plans and sharing the incredible resources of our own and other congressional collections um, to prepare teachers who are preparing our next generation of engaged citizens. And this work, everything that the Bird Center does is made possible by you, our friends at the Bird Center, and we thank you very much. Um, if you joined us for the first time this evening, I hope you'll visit birdcenter.org, learn more about our mission and our initiatives, and consider becoming a donor and a partner in um, making opportunities like this event tonight possible um, in the future. And thank you all so much uh, for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.